The Second World War dramatically changed the lives and attitudes of American women. The nation was strapped for manpower, industry and the armed forces as well actively recruited women, asking them to take on demanding and responsible jobs outside the home, at least for the duration of the war. So many women began working in areas that had been traditionally male. But as women discovered, the men in charge considered that change only temporary. The campaign to recruit nurses to serve in the armed forces did not strike Americans as unusual. Nursing was considered an appropriate profession for women, and women as Army and Navy nurses have been part of the American scene ever since the Spanish-American War. What was surprising was the number of American nurses who answered the call in World War II and served on active duty, 74,000. For Devons, Massachusetts, training center for United States Army nurses. They all have officer's ratings and go through a final four weeks course that closely parallels their brother officer's basic training. Thorough military orientation and physical conditioning fit them for service wherever American troops go. They'll fill jobs on hospital ships and trains, field hospitals, and behind the front lines evacuating wounded, sometimes under fire. The next time these officer nurses crawl, it may be on some foreign soil in aid of a wounded American soldier. No worry about keeping slim wasted for these stout hearted girls, and the Army needs thousands more like them. America honors Army nurses who served under fire in the Philippines. Heroines of Manila, of Baton, and Corregidor, their deeds have written an epic chapter in U.S. history. Mrs. Roosevelt looks on as six who came back received medals for valor. To student nurses, their courage is an inspiration. Caring for the wounded until told to go, they were the last to leave. Not all the nurses in the Philippines escaped. When Bataan and Corregidor fell to the Japanese, 11 Navy nurses, 66 Army nurses were among the Americans captured. And they spent three years in Japanese prison camps. As the war progressed, thousands of American nurses left the military and naval hospitals in the United States and went overseas. They served in every theater of operations, caring for the wounded, working with the surgeons, often in field hospitals very close to the actual fighting. More than 200 Army nurses were killed. 17 are buried in U.S. military cemeteries overseas. The American Armed Forces began recruiting women for non-combatant jobs to replace men who were needed to fight overseas. The response was immediate and enthusiastic. Almost 300,000 American women enlisted and served on active duty during the war. These military women were not nurses. They were something new in American life. In Washington, the commander of the newly formed Women's Army Auxiliary Corps begins her duties. A housewife and mother, she will direct an army of 250,000 women. Women who will work behind the lines, relieving more men for combat duty in the field. For the first time in history, the army now has an authorized army of women. Americans worried out loud and in print about the military women's safety or virtue or both. The newsreel saw her as a sexy wartime novelty and painted a bright picture of female life in the army. In reality, the military women often had to overcome condescension, prejudice, and resentment, but they persisted. The women picked up new skills, and most important, they won a permanent place in the American armed forces. The Army shipped 17,000 wax overseas. They were the exceptions. Most American service women, like the Coast Guard spars, were assigned to jobs in the United States. These spars at the Coast Guard training station in Atlantic City have completed a concentrated 20 weeks course in radio reception to qualify as radio men third class. They'll replace male operators on shore stations and release the men for sea duty. 
Commander Dorothy Stratton awards the coveted certificates. 53 girls are freeing men to fight, but 3,000 more are needed. This is our war, too, girls. American women exceeded the military's expectations. Many went out to the flight lines and into motor pools to take jobs that would release men for combat duty. 235 different jobs, according to one Army report. They served as mechanics and technicians, even as pilots. Hundreds were decorated for bravery. Hollywood cranked out a lot of movies about women in military service. Most were comedies that managed to trivialize and stereotype military women and tended to ignore their real accomplishments. At least two movie melodramas exploited the story of the American nurses captured in the Philippines. One army nurse who had escaped the Japanese denounced Cry Havoc as inaccurate, outrageous, and offensive. If Hollywood failed to deal with women realistically, the newsreels were not much better. Nobody should ever tell a wasp that flying's not a woman's job. They wouldn't believe it any more than if it were said a girl can't be a good flyer and a woman, a woman at the same time. <laughs> cradle of our Army's Air Force. And out of those buses are stepping girls. Girls who give a new angle to an Air Force story. They're what? Women's Air Force service pilots. But even before they get a chance to take the polish off their nails, it's out onto a dusty Texas drill field with them. Right away, the Air Force wants to get a little muscle on those pretty arms. This scene provides a pretty fair picture of what the girls look like from uh, all angles. None of them are under 21 or over 35. Now, chinning yourself is a very wholesome kind of, uh, very wholesome kind of, a, uh, thank you, sir, a very wholesome kind of conditioner for young ladies about to embark on a serious venture. Very simply and seriously, the wasps, girls like Mary Abbott, maybe a little younger, maybe older, are willing to plow into as rugged a six-month stretch as anything handed to women in the whole war effort. Map reading and physics, navigation and code, with strict AAF exams in each, too. For men, it would be tough. It's tough for girls, too. To be accepted as a wasp, each girl had to have 35 hours in the air beforehand. Enough to know men's airplane talk when they hear it. Graduation day means that they've grown up. They're army flyers. As they know, their experience here has been no interlude for romantic adventure, but a period of intensive training for a highly important job. At the moment, there's a bill in Congress to bring them into the Air Force. Each wasp, like other women in other services, has achieved no little thing. She's gone into a man's world because the men needed her. Gone through a tough ordeal as just a girl and come out a girl pilot with the U.S. Army Air Force. The WASP flew 60 million miles during the war, delivering all types of combat aircraft from the factories to the air bases. About 1,100 women were trained to do that kind of work, and 38 of them were killed in plane crashes. Fifty years later, the wasps had no war monument in America, just a few faded photographs and an old sexist newsreel in the archives. In America during World War II, there was never any shortage of sexism. It's the fair damsels to the rescue as Port Arthur, Texas, faces the loss of the watermelon crop due to the labor shortage. But they trucked on down to the field, these gals, and pitched in like veterans. It's enough to make your mouth water. Uh, the melons, of course. A peeping Tom, camouflaged by that high forehead. Should we tell these melon jolly babies? Oh, no, let's not. He's always wanted a picture of a watermelon, a melon patch commando. But these gals have done a patriotic duty, and Port Arthur's mayor saw to it that they received certificates of appreciation. 
Yes, sir, we can all appreciate these heroines of the American Crop Corps. Obviously, the newsreels did little to change American attitudes about women. At the time, most American women saw the war as disruption of their lives, not as an opportunity for social change. Few women doubted that life would get back to normal once the war was over. What most American women experienced during the war years was separation, or the fear of separation, from their sons, their husbands, from the men they hoped to marry if they ever came back from the war. Ladies and gentlemen, we're on location with Miss Loretta Young, where she's making her latest picture based on the war in China. As soon as she finishes the scene, she has something she wants to say to you. Cut! Hi, Mr. Yes. Thank you. Miss Young? Yes? May we have a moment of your time? Yes, you certainly may. Because that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask each one of you here to give me a moment of her time. I say her because... I want particularly to speak to you women in this theater. Women at War Week reminds us that we need no longer sit and wait. There is a job for each and every one of us, and it is our duty to find that job. Pardon me, Jane, America's gone to war. You can't waste your life sitting under the apple tree. There's a man's job to be done, victories to be won. They need you down at the factory So she gave up her nylons For coveralls and gloves And put her heart into change It all started a movement When she overcame her fears America would never be the same America would never be the same By 1943, women made up one-third of the American labor force. Twenty million women were working outside the home, not just at typewriters and sewing machines. Many were doing jobs that had been considered exclusively male. America would never be the 
same America would never be the same Isn't this a funny place for you? Not if it helps win the war. But after clerking in a fashionable store... I like it here and it saves my clothes. Yes, I suppose it would. Did you ever try pleasing a bunch of women shoppers all day? <laughs> no, I never did. Well, here I just have to please the boss, and he's a man. And the work isn't too hard for you? No, I used to work in a butcher shop. I like this better. It's more excitement. Isn't this pretty hot for you, Miss Spillane? Well, I hear it gets kind of hot around the kitchen stove, too. I never thought of that. Yes, and it gets pretty hot out there in the South Pacific. During the war, almost 15,000 American workers were killed or permanently disabled in industrial accidents. More than three million other men and women were injured. It was a dangerous environment, but that was something the government and the newsreels did not talk about very much. The emphasis was on patriotism and production, and in a manner peculiar to the times, sex. Once upon a time, there were beauty parades. All the girls needed was youth and uh, culture. But this is war. Today's beauty contests are in the shipyards, on the assembly lines. Here at Marin Ship, California, women welders have a lunchtime contest. Men workers vote on each girl's appearance, job record, and attendance. For now, Miss America is at work. The winner is expert welder, Mrs. Gladys Griffin, mother of two, and Mr. Griffin's in the service. I felt really very spirited and very proud. I was very young, I was 18. And um, I felt something about camaraderie of workers, generally men and women, and especially sisterhood among women that I have never encountered before or since because it was a very special, special time. I remember feeling very good and I felt good the whole time at doing this work that had traditionally been men's work and I felt proud and I felt able and capable and that I did a good job and that was true of all the women. I know how the men felt. They really resented us invading their territory. That was my concept of what was going on because a lot of us were young and some of us weren't too bad looking and they were very confused. And here were all these young girls and women coming into their territory and trying to do the same things they were doing. I feel that that was the beginning of women's liberation movement. Maybe they didn't realize it at the time, but it was, because we showed that we could do a man's job, and that there weren't that many differences. We were really good, you know? We were um, good at what we did, we felt good about what we were doing, and there was a special feeling, I think, among the women that we were part of this wonderful effort of building a ship, a beautiful ship a raw hulk that became transformed into this beautiful, shining ship that then we would see go off the waves. It was a wonderful experience. Child care was a major problem. 75% of the working women were married. Many of them had small children. The government helped some companies set up daycare centers, but there was never enough, and not many were as good as this one at the Kaiser shipyards. Of all the children who needed this kind of care during the war, only about 10% ever got it. President Roosevelt made several tours of the nation's war plants, and during one of his fireside chats, he told his radio audience about the women workers he had seen. I was impressed by the large proportion of women employed, doing skilled manual labor, running machines. As time goes on, and many more of our men enter the armed forces, this proportion of women will increase. Within less than a year from now, I think, 
there will probably be as many women as men working in our war production plants. Even at Army Proving Grounds, the so-called weaker sex is doing a man-sized job. Testing tanks is just daily routine for this all-girl crew. On the firing range, they try out the latest machine guns. A 50-millimeter aerial defense weapon with plenty of kick. Manning anti-aircraft batteries, they feed shells and fire them with clockwork precision. Our boys on the fighting fronts are worried. They want to know that you'll stay on the job with them until final victory is won. So don't quit your war job. You see, they won't quit when the news is good. They won't quit until they've won. And they want you with them, getting that last plane, last tank, last gun for final and complete victory. So let's stay on the war job and finish the war job. There was a great campaign at the beginning of the war to persuade women to go into war industry. It was coordinated by government and uh, the corporations and, and uh, trade unions as well. But before the war was even over, the uh, propaganda campaign began to uh, show itself in newspapers and magazines uh, in ads uh, persuading us that our place was, was back into the kitchen. How do you like your job, Mrs. Stoner? I love it. How about after the war? Are you going to keep on working? I should say not. When my husband comes back, I'm going to be busy at home. Good for you. Lee, what did you used to do? Believe it or not, I was a baby nurse. <laughs> well, quite a change to this. Yeah, but the hours are much shorter. And what about after this war, Lee? Well, this job belongs to some soldier. And when he comes back, he can have it. Oh, that's swell. <laughs> When the war ended, not all of the women washed up quietly and went home. About two-thirds of them kept on working, but not at the same jobs. Most were shifted to so-called female work, where there was less money and less chance of promotion. Women lost much of what they had gained. But the fact remained, American women had done a magnificent job during the war. That no one could deny or ever take away. More than two million American women, many of whom wanted to keep on working, were laid off when the war and the manpower shortage ended. The men were firmly in charge again, so it seemed. Many women war workers had been forced to retreat to their kitchens, but they had learned something about themselves and their abilities during the war years. Women had some new thoughts about their place in American society. The seeds of discontent and permanent change had been planted. Thank you.